This week, we're talking about the way of headship. It's different than the origin and the purpose. It's actually, what do we do as men? How do we live as men uh, and exercise our headship in the marriage relationship? We have been in Ephesians chapter 5 for the last few weeks. We began in verse 22, and I'll read the whole section for you so that you understand the context of what we're talking about. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might uh, present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So, husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. And for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and will be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh." This mystery is great, but I'm speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife, even as he himself. And the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. Now, contained in those verses is enough material for the rest of our lives, men. Um, and that's whether you're old or young. The way of headship in the Bible. The way of headship, like the origin and the purpose of headship, finds its source in the Lord. And we know this because the Bible tells us so, and Paul uses one example after the other in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 to the end of the chapter. He shows us to be the case, and And the common idea that runs through the entire text is that the way of headship is love. Love. In fact, there are at least five verbs that give us an outline of the way headship goes. The basis of these five verbs is found in verse 525. Husbands, love your wives. That is in the imperative That verb, love your wives, it is a command. It's not just a suggestion. Or if they do what's right to you, you should love them. It is a command outright. And then following, we see the examples of how to love our wives contained in the five verbs. And these show us the way of headship. It is a love that is to be sacrificial. Verse 25. It is a love that preserves, verses 26 and 27, a love that is nurturing, verses 28 and 30, a love that endures, verse 31, and a love that is demonstrative, verse 32 and 33. So we have it all laid out for us, men. We have no excuses. Now, if you've been a believer for any length of time, you might have already gone into snooze mode. Maybe you picked up your phone and you're going through Facebook or Twitter, whatever you do, due to the fact that you have heard about these characteristics used in exhorting you to love your wives, but I want you to sit up and listen, okay, today. I really do. And I'll do my level best to make these terms practical and explain how to apply them to your everyday experience as husbands. Yesterday, Mary and I had the extreme pleasure of celebrating 45 years of marriage. So I'm not only talking to you from the Word of God, I'm talking to you from experience. 45 years, by God's grace. I say that more for Mary than for me. (laughs) 
She says, it takes two people to live my life, and she's been doing it for 45 years. So let's bow in a word of prayer and ask God's blessing upon our time. Father God, as we come to you this morning and break open your word to look at it and explain it, we pray for your Holy Spirit to give the unction, the power, Lord, that your word deserves and that you would speak through this vessel. Father, that you would empower me to say what you want men to hear today. And Lord, that it would not be a scolding, but it would be an encouragement. We fully admit to you that there is nothing we can do in and of ourselves. Without Christ, we can do nothing. But with Christ, we can do all things because you strengthen us. And so, Lord, we pray for that today, even as we preach this word. In Jesus' name, amen. So, we're talking about the, the way of headship. How do we lead in our marriages? And the very first thing that I want you to notice is that we lead through love. It's a sacrificial love, a self-sacrificing love. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. The act of self-sacrifice is epitomized through the life of Christ, obviously. And so Paul uses Jesus to picture how a husband is to lead his own wife. Uh, this concept is well documented in other places in the Bible. Think of Philippians chapter 2, obviously, who although he existed in the form of God and did not regard equality with God, a thing to be grasped, he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, being made in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death on a cross. Humility is necessary in order to love in a self-sacrificing way. In Matthew 20, verse 28, we read, And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And what? To give his life a ransom for many. Men, we must learn to deny ourselves, to sacrifice ourselves for our wives' sakes. And what does that mean practically? I told you I was going to try and be practical. Because so often we can, I can tell you all the verses and tell you the tenses of the verbs and so forth. And so, big whoop, okay? That's all the stuff I studied. It matters to me as I deliver the word to you, but if it's not practical, it's not profitable. If you can't take what I say to you on Sunday and apply it on Monday, then I've failed. And so how does this play out in a very, very real way? Well, returning from a long, trying day at work and being met by your wife who says to you with a smile on her face, "Hun, could you please help with the kids so I can get dinner on the table? There you go. Enter self-sacrifice. The self-sacrifice is displayed in a, a dying to self and the need that you feel to just relax and leave the day behind you. So the self-sacrifice is instead of just pulling away and saying, I can't right now, babe. What you do is you graciously and joyfully, gifts of the Spirit, fruit of the Spirit, you graciously and joyfully muster up the strength to take the kids and do whatever needs to be done. Or take Saturday, for instance. You work a five-day week maybe 12 hours a day. But Saturday's here. Yay! You're all excited. You're going to go golfing. Or maybe that trip out to the river. Or maybe it's time to just hang out with the guys. But it's short-circuited by your dear wife, who again comes to you and just reminds you that school is starting soon and you need to go shopping for shoes and school supplies with the kids. Self-sacrifice comes in very clearly. It means setting aside your previous plans and joyfully, a fruit of the Spirit, stepping up to the lead, you go into the fray and take the children to Walmart and Target to shop 
as though that, that is not enough. As though that is not enough, you are taking the kids with you to shop. That's self-sacrifice, guys. And we don't do it enough. How about Thursday night? Fantastic dinner. She outdid herself, relaxing, hands behind the head. When you get this little nudge in your heart as you look at how tired your wife is because she just cuddled up to you and fell asleep. Dishes aren't done. They haven't even been cleared yet. Self-sacrifice means you listen to the nudge. And you consider that maybe tonight would be a good time to let her off to sit back and relax, and you clean up the mess. Wash the dishes, clean the counters, wipe the table down. That's self-sacrifice. <laughs> oh, we have such grandiose ideas of self-sacrifice. This is where the rubber meets the road. Or with your mind a million miles away, deep into your mind vacation. Women, that's something that is a very real thing that men can do. You are incapable of doing mind vacations. You do not have that capacity. That's a God-given trait that men have. And she sits next to you, and you hear her voice. You see her lips moving, but it's all very far away. Self-sacrifice means to return to earth, focus your attention, and really listen to her. Listen to her. To the things that she's saying. You actually, by an intentional act of your will, engage in the conversation. Actually hearing what she's saying. Actually talking over things with her. And even though you feel your brain is dead, you die to yourself. And you engage self-sacrifice. Self-sacrifice might be as simple as controlling your speech and not saying what you feel when you're irritated. Irritation is the big, biggest excuse men have for sin. I was irritated. No, you were sinning, either with your mouth or your actions, your behavior. For some men, this is really death to self because they have practiced an entire lifetime of uncontrolled speech and they just have learned how to vent rude, harsh, and belittling speech. Kill it. Kill it, men. Mortify it. Don't allow yourself to talk like that. Consider if you would do that if Jesus Christ was standing right next to her. You would not, and he is. Instead, the Bible teaches husbands are to love your wife so much that you're willing to die for her. And I'd like to think that most husbands really believe that this is the way that they feel, at least Christian husbands. They really believe that I would die for her, I love her. But most will never ever have to have the chance to literally die for their wives. And so our self-sacrificial love must be displayed in less glorious ways. But it'll be sac self-sacrificial love anyways, won't it? In the simplest terms, I know self-sacrificial headship is displayed when we give up our own desires and just plain die to self. We can practice this every day, beginning today, men. And this is only the first of five elements of our love to our wives. These words penned by an unknown source go a long way in helping us to grasp what it means to die to self. Listen to this quote. When you are forgotten or neglected or pur purposely uh, set at naught, and you sting and hurt with the insult or the oversight, but your heart is happy, being counted worthy to suffer for Christ, that is dying to yourself. When your good is evil spoken of or when your wishes are crossed or your advice disregarded or your opinions ridiculed and you refuse to let anger rise in your heart. Did you hear that? You refuse to let anger rise in your heart. Don't use the excuse, the devil made me do it. Don't let it rise in your heart. You tamp it down by the power of the Spirit of God because it is wrong, it is sinful to let that anger rise and vent. 
or even defend yourself, but you take it all with patient, loving silence. That is dying to self. When you lovingly and patiently bear any disorder, any irregularity, or any annoyance, and when you can stand face to face with waste and folly, extravagance, spiritual insensibility, and endure it as Jesus endured it, that's dying to self. When you're content with any food, (laughs) any offering, any clothing, any climate, any society, any attitude, any interruption by the will of God, that is dying to self. Are you getting a picture? This is very practical stuff. When you never care to refer to yourself in conversation or to record your own good works or itch after condemnation, uh, commendation, <laughs> you're getting condemned. <laughs> when you can truly love to be unknown, I just said that. When you can truly love to be unknown, that is dying to self. And when you see your brother prosper and have his needs met and can honestly rejoice with him in spirit and feel no envy or question God while your own needs are far greater and in desperate circumstances, that is dying to self. And when you can receive correction and reproof from one of less stature than yourself, You can humbly submit inwardly as well as outwardly, finding no rebellion or resentment rising up within your heart. That's dying to self, end quote. I don't know who wrote that, but it was someone who understood what dying to self means. So the first way of headship is seen in a love toward our wives that is self-sacrificial. Only by the power of the Spirit of God living within you can you achieve anything close to this. Secondly, it's a love that is a preserving love. Look at verses 26 and 27. So that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands ought to also love their own wives like that. The second way of headship is seen in a love that preserves our wives in the way of holiness and godliness. The example is given of Christ Jesus and his intent on sanctifying and cleansing the church by his word. John 17, 17 says us, says to us, Father, sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. Or in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, Paul speaking to the church at Thessalonica, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. It was the Apostle Paul's deep concern and prayer that God would preserve or keep the Thessalonian believers in the pathway of holiness until they receive their ultimate sanctification, their glorification. In the same way, husbands, we're supposed to sanctify our wives, to set them apart for holiness with the goal of presenting them to the Lord, holy and blameless. A lifelong passion that should direct our lives. Well, how on earth do we do that? Well, never forget that these are not just good ideas or suggestions, we're commanded to love our wives, and this is the way that it plays out. That love is an imperative command. Husband, love your wives. And so husbands are to love their wives in a self-sacrificial way, as well as with the intention to keep them in the way of holiness and godliness. How do you do that? Well, first and foremost, We're to be sanctified by the word. Thy word is truth. And so personal devotions together. The simplest way to do this is to consistently pray and read the word of God with your wives. You do not have to be a seminary professor. That's not what it says. I don't think it says anywhere in the scripture, husbands, teach your wives. 
you can just sit down and read a portion of Scripture with her and pray afterwards. That's all you have to do. It doesn't even have to take very long. The Word of God is what sanctifies. There are numerous devotionals that can help with this practice if you feel like, well, I don't want to just kind of, where, where do I go in the Bible? Well, get a devotional then. They track according to the date. There's devotions like Morning and Evening by Spurgeon or MacArthur's Drawing Near or Piper's A Godward Life, Our Daily Bread, Streams in the Desert. There's a hundred of them. If you want to know one, come and talk to me. I'll tell you one. But go through the devotion for the day. It's like usually a, a page long. It'd take you maybe five minutes max. And women, might I add something for you? Just listen. Mm -mm. And thank God that your husband's actually doing that with you. Don't tell him what you heard about on KTIS or KKMS or One Place or wherever else you go to to get your dose of the celebrity pastors. He's doing something for you. Let him do it and be quiet and thank God for that. Wow. Wow. How about encouraging her to be involved with other godly women? Men, this is another way. Initiate times together with other believing couples who are strong in the Lord. Go to somebody stronger in the Lord than you and have dinner together with them. Have them over to your house. Get yourself invited to their house. Do something. Guard against associations that take her away from God and his ways and personal holiness. You know those girlfriends that do that to her. Because you have to put up with it when you come home, when she comes home. <laughs> right? So help her to see those friends that are not a good influence in her. This is still a part of a love for your wife that preserves her for God and keeps her in the way of holiness. Guard her against blog sites and podcasts. Do you know the blog sites she goes to? Do you know the podcasts? She listened to, I'll tell you, they can really sway a woman. I'll never forget back in the day when people read magazines. Good housekeeping, some of the magazines, Home Beautiful. I mean, they throw women into a tailspin. They look at those homes and they look at their home and they look at those homes and they look at their home and they go, oh my gosh. And they get depressed. <laughs> well, you might want to just pull the subscription to Home Beautiful, okay? It's kind of like that with blogs and, and podcasts now. Do you know what they're listening to? Because they can really influence their thinking. Guard her against blog sites and those kind of things that don't support biblical values. And so self-sacrificial love and preserving love are just two ways that true biblical headship can be exercised. There is a third way, though. We see this in verses 28 through 30. Nurturing love. It's a love that nurtures your wife. Verse 28. So husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. The two words used here have a history in other Greek writing outside the Bible. Even the Septuagint in Job 39.14 uses the word here translated cherish. It's to show a mother taking her eggs, this is in Job 39.14, to a sun-baked dust so that they can be even warmer and bring them to maturity even quicker. It's the idea here. The whole idea behind a husband nourishing and cherishing his wife is one of gentle and caring protection and consideration. Now, men, I realize this is a hard call today because our women have become very, very strong. Our culture has turned them into warriors. Some refer to them as fierce women. And I'm talking about women within the church as well. And ladies, take a note here, okay? It's hard for a man to confront you and try to guide you and direct you and nurture you. It's hard for us. 
And so when we do, please help us. Help us. Don't push back so hard. We are weak sometimes. And we'll try and then we back off because it's scary. Or we just are fearful or we're lazy and we don't want to push through the push back. He's to provide a nest, if you will, the husband is. That's safe and warm and conducive to the maturation and growth, spiritual growth of his wife. First Thessalonians 2.3 shows Paul explaining how he carefully became almost like a nurse. He says, we were gentle among you even as a nurse cherishes a, her children. Or maybe 1 Peter 3.7 will help husbands to realize how to exercise nurturing love toward their wives. For it says, you husbands likewise live with your wives in an understanding way as with a weaker vessel. What does understanding way mean? It presupposes that you've studied your wife, that you actually know her. And so Peter says it's your job to study your wife, to get to know her intimately, to live together with her on the basis of that knowledge, of your understanding. Husbands are to meet the emotional needs of their wives. Connecting with them on that level may prove difficult for some men. I think I'll paraphrase that back and step back a bit will prove difficult for all men. <laughs> it's difficult. Her need to communicate will often be greater than your need. Okay? Nurturing love will listen with interest and engagement. Letting her talk with, not at you, is a vital aspect of nurturing love. Just that one thing, if we could do that, men. We'd go very far in living with our wives according to knowledge and understanding. That man knows what encourages his wife and what discourages her, and he protects her from the discouragement. He understands what makes her secure and what fears she has. He knows the things that strengthen her and those that weaken her. And in each area, he uses that knowledge that he has gained from studying her to bring her closer to God and protect and lead her and to nurture and cherish her before the Lord. And the wife being identified as a weaker vessel in no way means that she's inferior. But some fierce women may take it that way. That's not what that means. It means she's more delicate, like a fine piece of china. And the word for vessel can be translated as such. You need to be careful with something so fine as china or it may chip, be damaged, or even break in pieces because it's fragile. Not in a bad sense, it's because it's so fine. It does not serve the same function as an earthenware pot or an iron skillet. That's us, guys. We're iron skillets but rather taken to be a priceless piece of china. She's precious. That's the sense of the weaker vessel. And, and it's also true that physically, it is typical that the woman's stamina is less robust when compared with the man's. Now, women, don't get upset. Some of you can run circles around us, especially in your childbearing years where you have energy that's been bestowed upon you from God. It must come with the kids. I don't know. I watched the younger women amongst us that have kids and they're just running after them the whole day long. We had a couple visiting us and we took them to the Mall of America and they had two young boys. And they ran after them for four hours, both of them. And then they came back to our house and they wrestled with them. And then they put the kids to bed and I just went, whew, that is a young man's game for sure. It, it just must come with the kids, I don't know. But... It is true that physically, typically, the woman's stamina is less robust when compared with the man's. And so, this too should be taken into consideration. Self-sacrificial, preserving and nurturing love are all part of the way of headship, but so is this fourth element. 
enduring love. This is so important. The best advice I ever got in marriage was given to me by a Baptist pastor that married my wife and I. We hardly knew the guy. He hardly knew us. But we had to have a preacher marry us. And so he gave us one session of premarital counseling. Do you remember that? It wasn't even an hour, I don't think. But I received the best news ever from him, and it stayed us and kept us straight for 45 years. He said, there is no such word as divorce in a Christian marriage. Just get it out of your vocabulary. Don't ever use it. It is not allowed. Don't talk about it. Divorce is not an option for you. Get over it. Did you hear me? We said, yeah. I mean, we're just 19 and 18 years old. Of course, we heard you. We didn't know. But you know what? We believe that. And we practice that these years of marriage. And it's really helped us a lot. Marriage is not supposed to end when emotions ebb. Marriage should not terminate when love seems unrequited. It does not stop because problem surface and the level of infatuation dissipates as the responsibilities of life increase. That's a boyfriend-girlfriend relationship that you had in junior high. Or high school, maybe. Or grade school nowadays. I don't know. The marriage vow is from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, I promise to love honor and cherish you and forsaking all others to be faithful to you until death do us part. I've married a lot of people or performed the service for a lot of couples and some want to do their own vows and I'm cool with that. That's okay. You don't have to have the traditional vows but I make sure that they talk about being faithful to one another and they have until death do us part somehow in their vows. A husband is to love his wife until the end. Until the end. He is to leave all other relationships. What do you mean, leave all other relationships? Well, he's to leave all other relationships, signified by his closest relationship, being with his father and mother, and he is to cleave or join to his wife. Parents, friends, co-workers, work partners, fellow enthusiasts, that would be guys that ride motorcycles together with you or guys that work on cars together with you or guys that fish together with you. Enthusiasts. What you like doing and you've got guy friends that do it with you. You leave them for your wife. Doesn't mean you can't hang out with guys. Doesn't mean that you can't have co-workers, etc. It means that your wife comes first at all times, in all ways. It must be modeled by the husband first. You see, those vows are taken by the wife as well. But we're talking to husbands now, and we are to be the head. We are to lead. So we take this first. He's to become inseparable from her, glued together, if you will, or welded to her in every respect. Even as a picture painted by the Scripture, he becomes one flesh with her. That's why Malachi relayed God's feelings toward the failed marriages of his people. Quote, the Lord has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth against whom you have dealt treacherously, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. For I hate divorce, says the Lord God of Israel. So take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. That you do not deal treacherously. Why does God hate divorce? Well, because it destroys his witness in the world. And it hinders the potential for raising up godly seed. Because the children no longer have the security of parents who honor their covenant before God with one another, and thereby they receive the chastening words of the Lord, you have acted treacherously. Divorce is no joke, folks. It's no joke. There are implications for divorce that are so deep and far-reaching into the very fiber of your being and the being of your wife and your children. Jesus has said to his bride, I will never leave you nor forsake you. 
And so we've learned about the way of headship and self-sacrificial love and preserving love and nurturing love and enduring love. And finally, it's a demonstrative love. A demonstrative love. We see this in verse 32. This mystery is great, Paul said, but I'm speaking with reference to Christ and the church. The love of the husband toward his wife is a demonstration of Christ's love for the church. The idea is every Christian marriage is to be a manifest testimony of the reality, the depth, and the saving love of Jesus Christ. In marriage, marriage provides a living example to a watching world of Christ's love for the church. Now here's the thing, you Christians that are married, you don't have to constantly keep on pulling back the curtain and seeing how your marriage is doing and and are we being a good testimony to everybody. Just live and walk with Christ and your, your marriage will be a testimony of Christ in the church. We don't trust God's work in our life enough. Just live to the best of your knowledge with all your sins that you're aware of confessed and you're yielded to the Spirit of God and you will be a testimony of Christ in the church in your marriage. In marriage, the wife's submission is a witness of the church's submission to her Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And in a husband's sacrificial and preserving and nurturing and enduring love towards his wife, the world sees a living example of Christ's love towards his bride, the church. I never, <laughs> there have been some startling moments in my life that I've learned from men that never intended to teach me anything. One was when I heard that an older couple, friends of ours, and she was perplexed because she had to get gas, but her husband wasn't with her. And so she went to the Costco station and called him, and he came because she had never pumped gas in all the years of her marriage. He always pumped the gas. And I just went, wow. Me, on the other hand, I took Mary to the jungle. I said, pick up that bamboo. Come on, let's go. I learned. He was cherishing his wife in that simple way. She never pumped gas. That's cherishing. Okay? (laughs) Another one was just uh, the way my uncle Wally cherished Aunt Cecilia. (sighs) So many ways I can't even talk about it. He just cherished her. And it was obvious. And he wasn't a wump. He wasn't a pushover. He was a man's man, but he just cherished his wife. She walked on water for him, man. That was, and it was so obvious every time you're together. What a testimony. And that's the way our marriages should be. Each marriage is a divine display of God's design for the restoration of humanity. Our marriages are God's billboard of his redemption through Jesus Christ. Our, our marriages have the potential to be the greatest evangelistic tool God has given us to use for his glory. And without a word, just live together as God would have you. Well, it always comes back to the gospel. It always comes back to Christ. In these past few weeks, as we've been identifying and explaining the differing functional roles of wives and husbands, it's gotten pretty personal. It hits us right where we live. Some of us have a lot of work ahead of us, and others have been greatly encouraged along the way. Hopefully, all of us have been thinking and taking the truths and applying them to our lives. In verse 32, God transcends our subjective understanding of these things and brings it back to where it must always return, and that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. In verse 32, we read, Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife, even as himself, and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. This mystery is great, but I'm speaking with reference to Christ and the church, the gospel. How can a wife submit to her husband in a respectful way without enabling grace provided 
by the Holy Spirit of God. And it's impossible. And how, how, men, can we love our wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it without the empowering of the Spirit of God within us? It is absolutely impossible. It all presupposes that the gospel is in our lives. Without Christ, we can do nothing. But with Christ, we can do all things because he strengthens us. Jesus Christ is displaying his divine work in redeeming humanity through Christian marriages. And now you tell me, is marriage important or not? The union between one man and one woman for life, is that important or not? Marriage is worth fighting for, and good Christian marriages are worth every ounce of sacrifice that they take because we reflect the relationship between Christ and the church to a watching world. Now, I trust that these past weeks of just scratching the surface, I mean, we're just doing a a quick overview of the foundations of marriage because next week we're going to be talking about Jesus in Matthew 19 where the Pharisees on his way to Jerusalem, we kind of took a sidetrack here to talk about marriage first because on his way to Jerusalem, these, these Pharisees came up to him and tried to trap him and talk to him about, is it okay to divorce your wife for any old reason? And we get a whole teaching on divorce because Jesus responded to their question trying to trap him, but we get a lot of information on his view of divorce. And I did not want to go into divorce without first laying at least an overview of the foundations of what marriage actually is before we talk about the dissolution of a marriage. So you come back next week and pray for me throughout the week as I prepare that message, that it would be straight from the Word of God and that it would be straight to our hearts. Let's pray. Father God, as we come to you uh, this morning with these words and challenges, Lord, please help our dear men to realize that what I've talked about this morning, these five verbs that, that display what and how we are to love our wives, are impossible without you. Father, we cannot just grit our teeth and try to get it done. We cannot just hunker down and give it the old college heave hole. Lord, we must turn to you and repent and humble ourselves under your mighty hand and let you be God in our lives and through our lives, and then we will be able to do these things. And we will be a testimony to a watching world, and that is what we pray, Lord. Help us not to be discouraged. Help us not to be depressed. But help us to be challenged to trust you in a greater way. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.